for a while on Twitter. So it's exciting to finally. Oh, I'm meet. so I'm so sorry. That's, that's <laughs> awful. You should you shouldn't do that. Oh man. So y'all have never met before then. Uh-uh. Nice. Nope. That's the cool thing about these. I've always said it's just an excuse for us to reach out to people on like yeah. chat. And then you get to meet so many people for the first time, which is fun. Yep. There's always always somebody new that's like, oh, no, I've been following you forever. It's great. Like, <laughs> So, Brian, one of the things we want to do, uh, well, the, one of the things I've been thinking about as a streamer is how to like catch people's attention in the first few minutes. Mm. And, which is a hard thing to do because you're just kind of chatting and it's usually boring while people are joining, et cetera. So I've been wanting, in theory, to like, all right, what's a hot topic that would spark oh, no. conversation as people join in? A controversial topic, maybe. Oh, yeah. no. And uh, I feel like you're always good for one of these. Do you have anything that's top of mind <laughs> that you're like really excited about that maybe we don't need to say for the podcast? Um. You know, not not really. Like I, I there there was Twitter drama this weekend, but I tried not to be a part of Twitter drama on the weekends. Oh, what was it? It was something about GitHub. Like I actively oh. avoided it. It was like GitHub? I don't know about this one. Yeah, or about like using Git in some way. I, I don't. Okay. I don't know. Again, I didn't look into it at all. I was like, my no, weekends GitHub. better used elsewhere. Does, does anyone in the chat know the GitHub? Drama I did from the weekend? Uh, see. Are you Tailwind or no Tailwind? Mm, good good uh good hot drama mm -hmm. i like it yeah, uh, right. this is perfect for brian also it is right up my alley i i use tailwind in a lot of demos in fact um the the, the book that i'm writing <clears throat> uses tailwind in a few examples but um did i know this i don't know this about do me I? writing a book do i which one or is that oh, it's, not, it's, it's on 11 um it's actually it's, uh, it's, in, it's in my okay. plugs um yeah okay cool but yeah i i, I I like CSS. I like pure CSS. Mm -hmm. I hate using Tailwind because I know CSS very well. And I, I have to then remember what the classes are to do the things that I want to do when I could write the style. Yeah. However, when I'm teaching or doing like educational things that I still want to look good, using Tailwind is <laughs> kind of a no-brainer at that point. All good points. I'm right there with you. Oh, no. You're supposed to tell them how terrible those points are so that we can <laughs> spice I can, up the drama. I agree. Uh, I feel like, yeah, so I feel like you two implicit, have similar. Implicit or explicit stuff, returns yeah. in Ooh. TypeScript. I don't use TypeScript. <laughs> oh, hot take. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like <laughs> no, right? brand damaging. That's... I, I, I <laughs> love. The perfect sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> every every module that I use that has TypeScript, I love because I get mm -hmm. all the benefits of it. Yep. I, however, have not learned enough TypeScript to do them in my own work. Um, but... There you go. You found it. Too loud. <laughs> Sorry. My bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think TypeScript's great. I just haven't learned it. And it's really hard to do anything with. If you, It's ugly. Oh, oh, yeah, is TypeScript it's ugly. It's ugly. Although... In 2010, I made the, the bold claim that I would never be able to learn JavaScript because it was an incredibly ugly language. Uh, and now HTML and CSS for life. Like... Um, and then Wait, like two years later, I was managing a JavaScript library. Like it's, it's, it is what it is. Did you hear my drama in there? Oh, no. You talked about never learning JavaScript as a language because it was complicated and you liked HTML and CSS. And I said, not, but those, they're not languages. Not, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was just for starting drama. You yeah. know what, James? We should just have a show, like With an hot episode of hot drama. Yeah. It'd be cool if we if we got we 10 different guests to do like yeah. a but do them individually. Like just tell me your tell me your most controversial opinion. Uh-huh in five minute chunks or something that would be yes cool. i'm for it uh, I'll get, i like I'll html get <laughs> i like html sent from the server oh that was Mic very <laughs> but that's the opposite of a hot take now that's like where we are now with web development right like we we've now migrated back to that as a preference <laughs> or at least a lot of a lot of the frameworks are adopting tooling and encouraging that as best practices now which is fun 
ish we're getting there we're getting there um but i also, <laughs> I also like the authoring html like i enjoy the process of writing html and like i'm using astro using next using all these things that like i'm writing jsx components and i'm writing all these things in very javascripty ways and then i just break out 11 and i write html with like very few extra little bits and it's just a beautiful thing and i love it um and yeah J josh henry i'm blasphemous it's fine yes you are you know what I've done recently in my Astro site is I was working on my navigation bar. Um, mm -hmm. And so doing a collapsible like hamburger mini, like basic stuff. And But you need, or at least as far as I know, I need a little bit of JavaScript in there. Actually, I'm sorry. This is the wrong thing. Different thing. I need a little bit of JavaScript to dynamically change out the piece of text for the typewriter effect. Like it types one thing, it changes oh, yeah. to another. And uh, inside of Astro, I could have added React for that component, but I just added literally vanilla JavaScript in a script tag. So that was kind of cool. I haven't done that in Astro yet because I've, I've only been building it like a couple little demos. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll use React for it just to kind of show that off. But like the idea of just some vanilla JavaScript, like that's really appealing, especially since when you're authoring in like an Astro, like I ran into an issue in Astro where I wanted to use a React component as both html but then when it, i wanted it to rehydrate so i needed it to be both mm -hmm. and the way astro was doing like it was in, it was like nested in a weird way i had to like re like refigure refactor all of my code to make more of it react because astro needed i don't know it was a wrapper around it and some other stuff to do like the client load or client visible that sort of thing uh, and if i had just tossed a little javascript in it would have been just an Astro component with yeah, some JavaScript to have. JavaScript, yeah. Yeah. I'm so, kind of thinking that'd be a fun, deeper exercise. It's almost like teaching vanilla JavaScript, like Dom vanilla JavaScript through Astro hmm. is the thought. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Because then you say, get all Brian, the other good stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Could then. you do the typewriter effect with CSS? I couldn't. Mm. I, I bet, I, I bet like Jay Tompkins could. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he absolutely yeah. could. I was thinking, yeah, he could literally he could literally do anything. And I asked him because he was doing some wild stuff at Modern Friends when we were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was like, "Are you just using checkboxes for state <laughs> management?" And he's basically, yeah. Which, like, yeah. like at a yeah. certain point, you definitely that's not the way to go. It's just proving that he can. So I almost guarantee. You, well, I, I can guarantee you, he could absolutely do that with um, checkboxes, basically being state management, but. The, the specific thing that I did JavaScript for was to change the text. So yeah, not only you could do that with CSS. Yeah. So not just the typewriter effect, but the actual changing of the text that's combined. Yeah. I'm wondering if you effect. could do that with like pseudo elements and animations and keyframes. Well, if you, yeah. If you just had basically, you'd have a bunch of spans with the text already defined. <laughs> and sounds then you wonderful. Could, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it? A bunch of spans. Um, and then, and then go and, you could fit, you could Toggle like, yeah, you swipe them. them in and out and like change the visibility and then swipe it in, change the build visibility. I don't know. Yeah. There's ways. Like it, it's one of those times where it's like, yeah, JavaScript's probably the right way to go. Yeah. Like, I, I, I wrote an article or had a presentation part of it was like making the hamburger menu, the slide out menu in CSS only. Mm -hmm. Totally possible. But then there are like other issues to think about and there's some accessibility concerns around it and stuff like that. Josh Henry was saying you can achieve the type effect easily, mm -hmm. just like Brian described with spans. Yeah. Josh, if you, I'd love to see a demo if you have one of, again, swapping out the text also with that. Um, I'd be interested to see it. Roberta Bulls, Robert Table says, um, how long until we're back to making those spacer.gif elements again? I don't know spacer.gif. I never stopped. I never <laughs> stopped. Just kidding. What's, what's spacer.gif? So um, this it's was like school. back when I was writing checks, <laughs> James. Checks? That you were, you know, you said you've never written. Oh, a check. like the, yeah, the thing that I don't know how to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, back then, when I wrote checks, I also used spacer.gifs. And back then, when you made like a, a HTML page, you call it or I called it slicing and dicing because you basically get an image of your website, and then I'd slice it up into tables. I use fireworks to slice everything up. So everything like That's lives fireworks. in a cell of the table. <laughs> it was so I, good. And Amy, just, I'm pretty sure you and I images. came up in the same era. Yeah, I'm sure we did. I think you have a lot of 
I'm glad y'all met because I think you have a lot of stuff that you'd be excited <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> Uh, well, and we also need to like start the episode. I'm loving this conversation by the way, but, yeah. um, anyways, so in order to force the table to like maintain certain widths or heights, you'd use a spacer dot gif. So it was a transparent gif that would just be one pixel by one pixel. And oh. you would force the width or the heights to be certain things. Yeah. So yeah, because, because it was transparent, you could then yeah. stretch it and who cared about it being stretched? Exactly. And so yeah, you, you'd set a hard width, hard height, and it'd be your your table row, your table cell, whatever it was, would be the exact size you wanted because we cared. We these were websites <laughs> and boxes, James. Our aspect ratios were like 800 by 600. Like we, we had to cool. argue to so like this was finally the best way to do a spacer and 20. Like just spacing out elements. Uh well, like layouts. So yeah. usually the first row in all of my tables would be a spacer row and it would define the widths of every single column. And you would just also have like nested tables inside of nested tables yeah. inside of nested tables. But why a GIF? Why because not? I couldn't do, you couldn't do transparent. You can't do have pings. PNGs. We didn't have yeah. pings. <laughs> we only had 256 yeah. colors back then. But I'm still confused. <laughs> like why not like margin and stuff to give... The space there was no css james no css <laughs> wait what CSS this is, is very this is, different back then this is before wait, how, there was no too. css how did you stop how did you tell it to be one pixel tall or something width and height width and height width equals height equals yeah and those, HTML? And those were, those were yeah. unitless what? values what? unitless values <laughs> that were always pixels no no we're talking about a foreign time youngins man youngins. Yeah, i know right yeah, they, they don't were, appreciate wait. they don't appreciate where we are today Ooh, rounded corners, there was no right? css there was um, a world do you want to know how we did rounded corners rounded we'd have corners a table we'd have a table with the little rounded corner in a single cell and you would export that image of the rounded corner the and you corner. would put that yeah so you'd have um basically wait, so... what would that be a table of uh nine yeah is that right yeah, nine yeah. cells. Yeah. yeah, three across and three down. So it'd be like the top, the side. And then, and and then the we got better. We got we got got to do that nine in CSS, pointing. but not with border radius. We then had background images that we had to do that yeah. with. So you'd have a top background image, a bottom background yeah. image, and a repeating middle one, like a one pixel border. Mm -hmm. We also, and then we had all of our prefixes, and that mm -hmm. was before auto prefixer. And then yeah. we got auto prefixer. And file size was important then too, because you can't just, you know. Ooh, and sprites. <laughs> we had to have them in sprites <laughs> yes, so that like I you could only sprites. have one call, one AP, or one, one HTTP call. Do you know what a sprite is, James? <laughs> I do, specifically from doing game development for a while uh, yeah. um, and using those for animations. 13 prefixes. I also had a cheat sheet for every browser. You can hack Firefox with this, hack IE with this. <laughs> I, I was our main Internet Explorer 6 and 7 dev because I, and I never learned like, officially why things were broken the way they were but i broke them so much that like i could look and be like no you're doing padding you're doing padding there and uh -huh. like it's, yes. it's gonna do that like, yeah and try and like just imagine i can't <laughs> a world of debugging without chrome developer tools <sighs> there were no tools the the amazing we, thing right <laughs> <laughs> we kind of had firebug but not firebug. really which was we, an extension of firefox we had firebug and then uh, somebody wrote Firebug Lite, which yes. was a, a, like a, a bookmarklet you could use in Internet Explorer 6 and 7 uh -huh. that kind of worked. And you could get Firebug inside kinda. of IE 6 and 7. Yeah. Kind of. We just so, we just lost so much good content, y'all. Like this all would have been I, amazing. No, we have in the to podcast. use this. It's still we can we can totally use it. Um, I actually <laughs> I actually clipped a couple of things, so it should be on Twitch as clips. So yes. the here's like the one Roberta Bulls is talking about no autocomplete um, yep. back in the day. So here's the one thing that I actually so I started web development in 2016. So again, like I'd never done almost any HTML CSS JavaScript before then, and so I remember getting into Atom or Sublime or whatever, um, or Notepad plus plus or something. I remember getting into one of those coming from IDE world of C sharp and Java. I remember coming in JavaScript for the first time. You can type whatever the hell you want to. Gives you no errors, and it gave you no intelligence. The only intelligence it gave you was words that it you had already written on the page. So it had mm -hmm. those index where it would give you that. It had no other intelligence for anything, and that's as far back as I I go. Like at the time, HTML5 was already a thing. CSS3 is that even right? 
CSS3? That was already a thing. They definitely existed. I didn't know there was a time before HTML and CSS. Or before CSS with HTML. I didn't know. The the history of CSS is really interesting too. Like I I I'm gonna butcher all of it now because it's been a while since I've like read. But there's a like these interesting stories. Like CSS was not the original style specification. There were a whole bunch of specifications that were being written, and the I love hot takes, right? Like the the railing <laughs> people have against the cascade, but the cascade is a feature, not a bug. Brilliant. It's a feature because originally the concept was a website would have its styles. But then every user was going to, in their browser, have their own set of styles. And if you wanted the, the styles to, to overwrite properly, there had to be a cascading system. And so they wrote this cascading system, and it, it won out because of that. And then what, what average internet user nowadays is going to go into their browser and have a browser-based style sheet? But that was the, the original purpose behind it. And it's just it's a genius move. And here we are. So good. Well, two things I'm proud of. I don't know how to write a check. <laughs> and I don't know how to write a website without CSS. And I think those are very valid things to be proud of. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I can uh, Libby's in the line. chat now too. With uh, HTML oh, tags. That were all yeah. spacing, wait, spacing yeah. mattered with your HTML tags? Like indentation? Uh, No. Or you said but, I mean, it an inline. Oh, I thought he was saying inline like with padding. No, uh, the, like, of the yeah. of the indentation in in the actual tags though they had to be all caps they like gotcha. the capitalization oh. yeah, yeah yeah no yeah. inline styling with CSS yep, yep. one could argue dark mode extensions are yeah, kind of the line. same problem yep uh, so I think we just release what we just did and call <laughs> that's, it a day that's it that's <laughs> Honestly, all we got that's all we that's, got <laughs> that's it wow I um I never I never dreamed of such a day <laughs> oh I could keep going but uh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> I, I uh, you 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 get me on old school like web development oh, man, stuff and it's just so fun to talk about. It is. Mm -hmm. And some of it you can still use when you're talking about uh, emails. I was going to say y'all just y'all y'all were just talking about what that like last last the last episode or, or multiple episodes now yeah. I don't know but but like uh, doing email development I'm like yeah like write all your styles in line yes. like work in table based layouts most of the time. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, so good. I feel like such a millennial but the sad part is both of you are also millennials, I believe. Right. And I I'm feel a... generations apart from both of you right now. It's because it's because we're probably uh, I'm not gonna assume Amy, but we're probably both geriatric millennials. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that is correct. We or, are or I think you're probably sometimes. you're probably the same age, I believe. I, I don't mind. I'm 38. Go. I I will be 38 later this year. <gasps> Look at that. So, match made in heaven. <laughs> Oh, old people in developer people. years that's ridiculous <laughs> yep. i will say the funny thing to uh, me about being a millennial is it feels like it has the widest gap in terms of technology from mm -hmm. our geriatric millennials <laughs> to, to the regular ones, the like me, ones. The ones. <laughs> yes. yeah. which by the well, way tomorrow's my birthday oh happy, happy birthday. birthday and I'll, I'll be closer to your age i'll be 32 <laughs> oh <laughs> that's so that's cute so isn't it <laughs> you know what is sad though like i've always been proud of where I've been in my career at different points based on my age. Like mm -hmm. I love the like, Oh, you're only however many years oh, old. Nice. I feel like I've crossed the they threshold where anymore. like, it's not, <laughs> I'm not that young anymore where it's not impressive. And it's a very sad day. Yeah, I just had that, that a similar thought the other day where somebody was talking about like people thinking they were older than they are. People thought I was like mid twenties all through my early twenties, like 20 through 25. Like people thought I was around like 25, 26. And then I hit that point, And I also feel like, Maybe this is Bane. I don't know. But like, I feel like visually I haven't aged much since then. Mm, like, old moves, so huh? like now I feel like I look young for my age. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, but definitely age. early 20s was, was good. Uh, I feel like I've aged within the last couple of years with COVID. Definitely. Definitely. True. <laughs> Thanks, <Yeah. James>. <laughs> <laughs> Just the world. I know, right? It's just, you know, a few Brian more wrinkles, a few more gray hairs. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> I do have... I do have some gray hairs that people care about. Uh, well, your hair's I, not long enough. It's really strange when I lose a hair and it's like brown gray. and then gray. Like you oh, can see it where yeah. the break is. Yeah. I've got a few like in here too. My uh, my brother and my dad both have a red streak in their beard. 
Um, or I say mm. they used to have a red streak in their beard, but that's the first thing that goes gray. Really? And so like, I never had that. And I was always a little jealous of it, but now I have no, like, there's no gray, Nice. but my, my brother had gray in his beard about my age and he's about four years older than me. So Todd says that I should get into accessibility. <laughs> I'll be as gray as he is in no time. True story. I don't know if that was intentional, Todd, but I like that you said gray is G R E A Y that way you're <laughs> satisfying the Americans the and the British. Yeah. I yep. feel like that was very accessible for is either. It, <laughs> is it British and American? I, I couldn't have thought like, oh, I just, whatever. Gray one. American is a Y uh, yep. gray UK or really? British is I've E-Y. never, yeah. I just probably use both without thinking about it. Yeah. And I feel, oh. I think uh, actually in code, I think it'll work either way. I E-Y think I've A-Y. heard that before. That sounds familiar. It's it's probably aliased, yeah. Uh, in my in my early twenties, in that same time period, I also went through like a British phase, and so like I spelled everything like British ways. So I still to this day like e, uh, ey is still my first way to go for for gray. How do you spell um, color? Do you, S-E? Now, S-E? Yeah, or because you know in English it's usually Z E on say like initialize mm-hmm. versus uh, yeah. British is S E. I and didn't then, write the word initialize that much back then, so I don't know. Isn't that funny? <laughs> like, yeah, you just never came across. Yeah, yeah. C- color what, was definitely with the U back then. Now it's now it's not. Like, it's or uh, no, what still yeah. gets me is Canadians call a Z Z. Z. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that West Boss character. Yeah. I'll be in Canada Z. next week. By the way, nice. That's so exciting. My birthday trip to Montreal. I was gonna tell you, Henry found a. I think it's an Instagram channel that they do like these French sayings. And every word sounds the same. And they're like, how would yeah. you ever learn mm-hmm. French? Because <laughs> so French is so annoying because they don't pronounce the back end of a lot of words. So if you look at conjugations of like first, second, first, second, and third person, almost all the time sound the exact same in the present tense because they don't pronounce the endings, which is wild. So crazy. My favorite thing. So I worked for a, for a French company for a while, and um, like them talking about their Who's language, the like Algolia. Oh, I didn't know they were French. Okay. Yeah, they're 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 centered in Paris, and uh, but like they're they're like yeah, we just in French you just don't pronounce things whenever you don't feel like pronouncing things. Like it's just mm-hmm. it's whenever. <laughs> um, so yeah. All right. Hey, all right. We gotta we gotta get started. But I'm curious about this. One. Uh, Diamond Boy says, speaking of controversial takes, every React framework is a solution to an issue a previous React framework created. Yeah, that's true. React framework. Meaning like Next.js, Remix, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Meta frameworks. Yeah. Is that they created. I I, mm-hmm. I support this hot take. Mm-hmm. Like, I do too. But it's a good thing. That's that's the mm-hmm. React community responding to issues. Yeah. Yeah. But how did re I'm not necessarily arguing, I'm just curious. How like thinking about built in routing with Next.js and, and Remix. It's not a problem. That's not a problem that React created. That problem needed to be solved regardless of if you use a framework at all. So there, 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 probably, use... there are multiple things, right? There's multiple things that they're solving, one of which is the routing. File-based routing is huge. Like mm-hmm. figuring out how to do routing in React, there were solutions and they were all terrible and I didn't learn any of them because I didn't have to. But like I can now use routing in React because of Next, because of file-based Correct. routing. Correct. I just don't know if React actually created a problem. I don't know if React created a new problem because without a framework at all, you still have the issue of how would you handle routing? The the, se- the second problem that Next is solving uh, that React didn't solve, let's say, le- left alone, was React came about and we had s- single page applications all over the place. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem in multiple, multiple ways that we don't have enough time, even with now our shorter <laughs> amount of time to cover in even a single episode that single page applications are a problem. But they solved that as well at the same time. And so React creating the problem of single page applications is solved by both the dynamic and the static routing that Next.js brings to the table. I feel like this could be a fun long uh, Next this could also actually helps solve caching too. problems. Ooh, Let's talk about one. that. That's where I thought you were going. Yep. Caching problems. What are caching problems with? So caching problems specifically? Elaborate. Yeah, like when you're... Oh, goodness. I don't know all the details <laughs> of caching because I use Next. I use those frameworks that solve the issue for me. But when you're talking about like just trying to manage... Uh, <laughs> are you going are you going like the the static content route like 
the fact that you can like statically I mean, generate content. Brian, do you know what I'm trying to say? I, I unfortunately I'm I'm not quite with you oh, on that. I haven't haven't oh. picked it up yet. Hold on. I mean, if we're talking about like cash busting, that's a thing, right? Yeah. Like the fact that we had one big bundle and now we we have this you know new set of fun. I would still I'm go gonna, like overall. I need take, to I would come still, back to this one. Fair. I would still semantically debate that React that either either the fact that React created the problems or if they created problems that weren't necessary, if that makes sense. Like it almost it almost makes it seem like we wasted a bunch of time by going down the React way to get to things on top of it. But I feel like the whole thing has been beneficial. Like having React was a game changer in the entire ecosystem. And because it got adopted so much, now we're just continuing to iterate, which I still look at as a very net positive versus if you phrase that semantically as a net negative by we wasted a bunch of time with React, if that makes sense. Well, I don't I don't think that's what the the original take means though, right? The, yeah, the original not. conversation yeah. is every React framework is a solution to an issue that the previous one had. That is the the ecosystem correcting, right? That is a a positive move forward. Here's the I, here's yeah. the one caveat to what you said is the statement again this is all semantics yeah. and i enjoy it because it's fun that uh diamond boy said a previous react framework created versus had there's like implications there that make a difference to me semantically that like implies the negative like we negatively created these things but had totally makes sense to me i think it's <laughs> it's where you place the blame for where these things come from yeah React created a completely new paradigm in the way that we write our applications for the web. And we now have, I mean, we had some of this before. I've made web apps without React, right? It all right. existed before. Mm. And but without CSS too. I never, I, I never <laughs> made a web app. Well, no, I made a web application without CSS. Anyway, um, <laughs> forever ago. But we had a different set of issues. And when React came around, it opened the, nor the, the door to new types of, of things we could do on the web and new, new ways of doing it that by necessity then created all these new problems. Like yeah. we didn't have to think about these things before because we didn't have the ability to do it this way. Yeah. But Fair. once we started doing it this way, there are issues inherent with that yep. that then the next piece, the next meta framework on top had to fix. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, we created the issue, I'm React you, didn't, but React opened the door for us to make the issue. Yep. Humans are a problem. <laughs> Humans are always the problem. I'll definitely buy into that. I think that that makes, again, okay. I was being very picky semantically, but that makes total sense to me. So we... let me see if I have the caching thing right. And then. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> I, was, I thought you were going to be like, we should start recording. We should, but well, like, I said we that like five times, but now we should just like make this the episode <laughs> and like go it. back and like backfill the intro. Yeah, I was thinking about that. <clears throat> okay, note to Ashley. So <laughs> Ashley caching, let me good. caching. Let me see. I'm gonna need help. <laughs> uh, caching when you're talking about static stuff, like the browser handles all that, right? So that's part of the reason why we swung back to static things but with next you can do it on this on the server or you can do it on the client side so when you're talking about caching on the server you have immutable assets like javascript css and images the next helps you handle i'm digesting that technically i React have their documentation gives you... pulled up <laughs> i have their React documentation gives you pulled immutable up stuff too like if you so, get into see, that's part of the beauty of like say Vercel or nellify is that they're all tied into that framework and can handle those caching things for you and why you have the beloved and i'm using that um sarcastically <laughs> yes thank you for the air quotes <laughs> the beloved image tag from next i say beloved because mm. people hate having to pass in all the things and wrap it in weird ways and yeah mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I don't even really use the image tag in Next because I always forget how to use it. I'm it's, just like, I know, I can, right? use it. Well, I can use the HTML image tag. It's fine. Yeah. And sometimes when you're dealing with good. responsive stuff, it's like, I don't know what the width and the height is. That's your job. I, yeah. I've I mean, never I don't do anything why. important. I do toys. Like, I, <laughs> I don't <laughs> launch production like, websites. You yep. sound like James. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. 
That's exactly how I am. I, every time I go to do that, I'm like, why would I know the width and height beforehand? That seems silly. <laughs> well, it's like, that's a very 2003 thing to do is to yeah. know the width and the height. <laughs> but if you don't have the, the width and the height, and this is, this is, I think, an important thing that we don't do enough in the industry. You have flashes of unstyled content almost no matter what. Yes. Because if the image takes a, an extra second to load in, the browser doesn't know the space that image is going to take up. If you define your width and height on that image, the browser will know the space and then it will be a big blank spot that can fill in and your yep. content mm -hmm. doesn't jump around. Because I hate reading an article and having my content jump around. That's oh, the worst. That's or when you go to uh, click a button and it jumps and then you end up clicking the wrong thing. Yeah. Yep. I'm with you. Um, and we do get to know that ahead of time if we use lovely tools like headless CMSs, Jamstack, mm. and all that sort of thing. Welcome to another episode of Compressed <laughs> FM, a podcast all about web development and design with a little bit of zest. In this episode, we're going to talk all about Jamstack, how it's changed, hot takes, all the fun stuff that we can think of. Web development and design, who would have guessed what we can do on both, even add a little zest. So turn up the volume, get ready for the best. Let's get it started in this episode of Compressed. What's up, everyone? My name is James Q. Quick, and I am a full-time technical content creator. Hello, my name is Amy Dutton, and I am the Director of Design at Zeal. And today we are sponsored by Daily.dev, which is Amy and I's favorite Chrome extension for keeping up to date with content in the web development ecosystem. You can choose uh, different categories of things that you're interested in, and then when you open a new page in Google Chrome, it will show you relevant articles that you can go and read or videos to watch to get all the information that you might need. This is actually my favorite way to find content to inspire content that I create myself for new products and things like that. So thank you to daily.dev for sponsoring, and you can check them out at daily.dev. So we've got on Brian Robinson uh, to the channel today. Brian, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about you? Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Robinson. I'm the head of DevRel at HiGraph, a headless CMS company. And I've been doing some form of web design development for like 15 plus years, I guess. Um, actually, probably more than that now. Starting like, like more than that if you've been. <laughs> well, I, I've, been, I've been doing web design development non-professionally for longer mm -hmm. than that. Uh, yeah. But I got my first web design development job in like 06, 07, um, where I had to care about all the things that, that you have to care about for old stuff. But uh, yeah, I've been, I've been doing, doing this a long time. Um, I'm a big proponent of things like the Jamstack, the serverless space, uh, mock architecture, uh, HTML, as it turns out, uh, CSS, all those good things. And uh, I've been doing some like the content creation thing, like, like, like James. Um, for, for a while now as well, uh, managing communities, writing blog posts, creating YouTube videos, all the things that good DevRel does I've been doing for a while and am now doing professionally as well. A little bit of additional context. Brian, uh, lived in the Memphis area until a couple of years ago. So we got to spend lots of time True in story. person together. Um, Brian's probably the biggest influence in me, like getting into the concept of the jam set no. taught me a ton over, I know. Uh, Another the Tennessean. Last several years, yep. yeah. Amy's down the down the road in Nashville. Um, oh, nice. I went to school just outside Nashville. So where? Wait, where did you go to school? Middle Tennessee State University. <gasps> That's where me Amy too. was. And you're the same age. Me too. We're, we had to have been there the same time. <laughs> I, I I graduated in in 06. Me too. Oh goodness, me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. Uh, that's so funny. Did we wow. know each other? Uh, did oh, were you uh, the, the, uh, the philosophy were department? About? <laughs> Sorry, what? Sorry. I said, were you, were you part of the philosophy department? Uh, no, I started a philosophy class and I immediately dropped it. <laughs> I started oh. intro to philosophy and then immediately became a philosophy major. <laughs> yeah. uh, so my professor was an adjunct and then was like, hey, we're going to change the syllabus every three, no, no, it would have been three months, every three weeks based on what type of government setup we're talking about. So when we're doing democracy, you guys get to vote on all the days, all the deadlines, when we're taking tests, everything. When we're doing monarchies, I'm telling our dictatorships, I'm telling you everything. <laughs> I was like, I can't handle this. I'm done. Who was your professor? I don't even remember. I dropped them. Okay. I went to one okay. class. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to switch to business 101. <laughs> well, like the fun thing is I actually went because Middle Tennessee is a uh, is a very strong uh, recording industry 
yeah. uh, college, like one of the best in the U S yes. and I was totally going to do music industry. Like that was, a, I was going to be like on the technical side of it. I was really passionate about music. I'd been playing uh, saxophone since like third grade. Uh, and I was like, I'm not good enough to ever be a professional musician, but I like, I'll do the tech stuff. That sounds like fun. Yeah. And there's this like whole spreadsheet you had to go through to like, see if you qualified to join the program. Like there were GPAs and they were multiplied by these things. It was ridiculous. And so like, at, like midway through my intro to philosophy class, I was really enjoying it. My mother forced me to take it because I didn't have enough hours my first semester. Um, and I went in and I was like, I really want to take this upper division philosophy course. It sounds really interesting. I think it was philosophy of language. I was like, what, what do I need to do to like get into upper division? Like, how do I do that? And I think it was the head of the department was like, um, you sign up for the class. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I can do that. And I have a degree in philosophy. So oh, that's funny. So our editor, Ashley, is at school at MTSU for recording yes. industry. Yep. Blue Raiders. Yep. So good. Best, and, best um, mascot in, in collegiate sports. A, well, a I was going to say a Pegasus and Pegasus got its wings like this year. Apparently it was like a thing. <laughs> they had a whole ceremony because it was a horse, a Pegasus with no wings. So now it has wings. <laughs> nice. Congratulations on that major accomplishment. Oh my. <laughs> Big milestone. <laughs> so, this conversation has gotten even better. Speaking of Pegasus and the jam set. <laughs> uh, right. Total great segue. Perfect. Oh, I know. I usually do. I don't I don't even know how to define the jam stack anymore. Like I feel like mm. for a couple of years we had a really good idea of what the jam stack was. And now to me, jam stack just kind of means modern web development, which is much different than what it was two years ago in terms of best practices and what we recommend and tools and all the things. Where do you even start with defining what the jam stack is for you now? So my personal opinion on jam stack hasn't changed significantly. So I didn't know much about the jam stack when like you were talking about like me introducing you to the jam stack. It was it wasn't even, it was barely a thing, right? It was mar a marketing term that Metlify came out with actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I was already doing static sites and no one wanted to talk about static sites. Static sites are boring. Why would we do static sites? We have servers, we have databases, like this is what we want to do, right? A request goes to the server, it generates HTML from the database and spits it back out to the browser. That's how we do web development. I hate servers. And at the time I was managing a giant Rackspace server for like 150 clients in Memphis. Like it was terrible. Like it was it's job security, but like, I didn't want to be doing that. And I got into Jekyll and I got into all these kind of cool static site stuff. And I got to do all the things that I enjoyed doing about web development without having to worry about the server. Like I got to use all the like includes and data and like all these cool things without having to manage a server. And I got the HTML and I didn't even care about like the marketing side of it. We're like, Oh, you know, it's going to be great for performance because you're just, you have pre-rendered HTML and you're good to go. Um, but kind of getting into it further, like this idea that's CDN driven and you're serving, you know, HTML directly from an, uh, an optimized server in the location as close to your user as possible. That's all great. I still lean towards that, except for now, I would say it's not about static site, it's a static sites plus, right? Like that's kind of how it used to be in a lot of people's minds. It's much more the static first mentality. And I, this is this is not everyone, right? I am not the arbiter of the jam stack, far from it as a matter of fact. But like the idea like with, with Astro and with Next and with some other stuff where you, you serve HTML from the CDN and then you can do other things with it in more and more compelling ways. I think to me, that's the heart of the jam stack. It's the idea and the philosophy of it. So like, I would, I would say like remix, right. Is not technically in my opinion, jam stack. It's great. And it's a, it's an important thing, but to me, that's like a server side language. And even like to a degree, I saw a great take. I don't remember whose take it was, um, that people trying to do too much static with Next are not thinking about Next in the right way. That Next is actually itself much more of a server-side framework, even though technically it's not built in that way. But you can kind of see that in the fact that like one of the big downsides I've got with Next, and I'm going like way down this rabbit hole, so you know, apologies, but like one of the big problems I've had is the ideas around like global data right? Like there is no easy concept of global data in Next because 
by definition, Next wants to be able to rehydrate everything. It wants everything kind of componentized as much as possible. But I wanted to create a navigation based on data from a headless CMS. I wanted to create my navigation as an array in a headless CMS and then pull that data in across all my templates in one of my layouts, right? I wanted it to be global data at that point. It had to be on every page. And the only way to do that was to use, I, I think, get server-side props. Like I had to use the server-side functionality. I couldn't use the static functionality. I could be wrong, or maybe Next 13 solves that. I don't know. I haven't gotten into Next 13. But like, to me, that speaks to this idea that, honestly, these meta frameworks are advancing into almost server-side space. Now, they do it with plenty of things for those of us like static as well, but they work better as a server-side framework. Um, Re Remix is specifically intended around a lot of that. Things like Astro, mm, things like Astro <laughs> are not, right? I mean, maybe they get there. Maybe they're on the same trajectory as everywhere else. Like 2.0 has got some interesting stuff and I, I know that they're going to get bigger and bolder on everything that they do. But they're all about static HTML and then doing little things with it. Static HTML plus, they're all about kind of the Jamstack mentality. Um, and I think that's where my heart is in the Jamstack. And that's where I define the Jamstack um, for what's worth. I think, I think I'm, I'm right there with you of, we had this like huge focus in the Jamstack of statically generated content. Um, and I think to your point, we realized it was great or it is great for what it is. And that's a best practice in a lot of cases, but we still need more. And that's where you talked about like this plus, and that's where these other frameworks I think have evolved to adding the server side component with get server side props and in react, for example. And they've even, I think collectively you're seeing more and more frameworks now incorporate more of this service or server functionality and shipping stuff from the server more so even though at times from the static content. And the one thing I'll maybe add and then question you if you think it counts, I think lots of people when they looked at Remix comparing to Next.js talked a lot about, oh, Remix doesn't do static pages. But Remix, I think very eloquently did a blog post, a fair blog post to compare themselves to Next and talked about the benefits of caching just in general and how the benefits of using Remix with caching gave you the exact same benefits that static content, pre-rendered static content would give you. And so I'm wondering, does that, does that kind of close the gap at all of, of kind of bringing Remix into the ecosystem or into the Jamstack context for you when you think about how they would advertise caching kind of being their equivalent of statically generated content? It was, I, I vaguely remember that blog post. It's an eloquent blog, blog post. I think it is fair points. I don't, Again, my opinions, right? I'm gonna, <laughs> let's start from the get-go on that. Um, to me, caching does not equal Jamstack. And I'll explain that a little bit by going way back in the day. Uh, and depending on how this, this wonderful Tie episode- it all together. That, well, and, and depending <laughs> on how this wonderful episode is being edited, right? Because we got a lot of back in the day from, <laughs> from the pre-stream, which will hopefully see the light of day as well. But back in the day, uh, I worked at a newspaper uh, and we had movable type blogs. Oldies will, will, will know what that is, but it was a blogging platform that was written in Perl with a little bit of PHP. Uh, but what it did was it pre-built HTML when you published the site. So it was the Jamstack. Like you published and it went through and what we had a huge blog, like a, an absolutely monumentally huge blog that had thousands of posts and when I would make a change to the template for the sidebar, it would have to regenerate all the HTML pages. It would take 30 minutes. So, I mean, it was just like ridiculous, but it was what we do nowadays. So we did movable type and I hated it. Like it was terrible. It was really hard to work with. This one change would take 30 minutes if I needed to do it. And so we moved as everyone did in this time in like the 06, 07 kind of era, we moved to WordPress. Server side, database driven stuff. Now, at the time, there were a couple big uh, court cases happening in, in Memphis. And in, in, I, I was at the, the commercial appeal in Memphis. And we spun up what we called uh, the court blog, courtroom blog. Uh, we, we had a, a special like marketing name for it. It was great. Uh, but I built it in WordPress because we were moving to WordPress and didn't think anything of it. Because like we got like 
thousand page views a day. We got like maybe three thousand page views a day to the blogs. Like our biggest one, which was the uh, the Memphis Edge, which was the big sports blog, um, was getting like ten thousand views a day. So it, like not huge, not anything massive. Um, let me tell you, this courtroom blog during this time period exploded. We destroyed that server. We're talking like hundreds of thousands of page views in a day kind of kind of level and no caching zero caching because i had no clue what i was doing like this was my first professional development job i just installed wordpress it was great and we destroyed the server um caching as it turns out hugely important <laughs> for for web performance massively important if i went to and built a wordpress site and installed a very hardcore cache on it that generated things like once a day. I don't even know. Some, something like really ridiculous. Is that the jam stack? Are you asking me? I it's semi rhetorical, but yeah, <laughs> is it the jam stack? If you well, so when you say caching, and then you you said two things that maybe are slightly different. Um, so you said caching, then you said generate them once a day. So do you mean going through and generating each page once a day? I said like the, 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 the cat, the, the TTL or whatever it is in, ca in cash line, not a great de developer. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> as it turns out, um, if I set that to like 24 hours mm -hmm. for the, like the, 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 the length that the cache exists. Mm. So that I think what that means, I would love for someone to come on the podcast, by the way, and do a deep dive on how caching works. Cause I have a million questions. Yeah. Not, not <laughs> me either. I, I would be the person with questions. Um, but that, that that feels that feels like the benefit to me of what we're talking about, which again, I think in my mind goes back to remix, like having the benefit of having the benefit of statically generated content without necessarily statically generating content. Yes. And that absolutely, but I don't I don't necessarily see how that differs from a really strong like developer experience wise, huge difference, right? I'm not like remix is awesome. But I don't see philosophically how that differs significantly from a server-side rendered application from a database such as a WordPress blog caching. I, I don't philosophically see the difference, so therefore I don't categorize Remix necessarily as a Jamstack framework. Is it? Smarter minds than me will probably tell you that it is. I, fu I fully admit like I'm not a Remix expert. I've used it a little bit. I've done the Hello Worlds. Um, however, Caching to me doesn't mean the jam stack. Yeah, I guess I just think about like what we did statically generate. Con so to draw two parallels or to draw a parallel from both sides to each other is we went through the, like this iteration with the jam stack where we did so much statically generated content for a few different reasons. One was in theory, it's infinitely scalable, right? Like you have these assets that are replicated on a CDN, which means when you get a bunch of traffic, you're not having to actually call your server, which means like you can actually handle the load and traffic because you're just requesting assets from a CDN. That to me is the same benefit of what you just did in WordPress where you saw that example and then you tweaked what you were doing to add caching, which those to me now seem like they're in the same category of fighting for the same benefits. Yes. <laughs> so that's so why... Is yeah, go this ahead. is interesting. I don't know how this fits into the conversation exactly, but I Googled... What is the Jamstack? And on the <laughs> Jamstack.org website, they are talking about what is Jamstack. And it talks a little bit about the architecture, but it says the core principles are pre-rendering. Mm -hmm. So I think that that yeah. fits into your question of is Next or Remix? I mean, Next, you have both, right? But is Remix technically part of the Jamstack? And then... Uh, the main tools are Gatsby, Hugo, Jekyll, Eleven D. Next, it does say Next.js, but those are the tools that you would use to mm -hmm. pre-render your site, and then obviously JavaScript. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go go to my degree in philosophy here and say like, oh boy, part of what we need to do <laughs> when we're having a discussion around what things mean, um, which is a fun conversation. And this is a conversation that happens like literally every year in the Jamstack ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And they, they literally just updated that uh, definition last year, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Like I, I remember when they, when they like were, were play testing it and then when they, when they launched it, but um, all that to me might mean something very different than what it means to James. The word the, I think that the, the word that is the crux of it 
is the word pre-rendering. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to pre-render? Yep. Because theoretically, a cache is a pre-rendered page. Yep. Mm. Yep. That's what I was So I suppose tricky. when, yeah. in, in my mind, and where my personal philosophy of the Jamstack lines up is when you do the pre-rendering. I don't think that pre-rendering on the server at request time and then everything following that is necessarily Jamstack. Now, there was before that new definition, uh, I remember this was like four or five years ago, uh, Phil Hawksworth having a conversation, Phil Hawksworth from, from Netlify, around the adjacent technologies of the Jamstack and what was and what wasn't. Again, it's all semantics and it's all mm -hmm. honestly not that important as much as, yep. as it is incredibly fun to talk about. But like serverless functions, are serverless functions Jamstack? Mm. Probably not technically, right? Because serverless functions don't technically involve pre-rendered or rendered content. They're all about adding additional functionality to something like that, all about mm -hmm. the efficiency of the developer around that ecosystem. So technically, serverless functions aren't part of the Jamstack, although the Jamstack is way less interesting without them. Therefore, Next and doing all the server server side stuff on Next, right? All the kind of server rendered content on Next, for the most part, and I could be wrong about this, is done via serverless functions, ones that yep. we don't have to write because Next and the platforms write them for us. Uh, but they're all they're all done via serverless functions. So if I need the Jamstack to be defined to include serverless functions, then I have to include serverless functions. And then there's this like slippery slope. And then as James, you put it earlier, include everything. does Jamstack just mean modern web de development practices? And at that point, is it a meaningful definition? And is it an important definition? I think I, to... I like doing things with the technologies that, that evolve and have come up with the advent of things kind of named the Jamstack for yeah. good or ill because everyone's tried to rename it because it's it's a Netlify term. They came up mm -hmm. with it. I'm still going to call what I do the Jamstack. <laughs> Remix can call what they do the Jamstack and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, it's still an incredibly fun way of building and a, an incredibly super powerful way of building. Yep. I think that's, that's why I've just kind of leaned into, for me personally, the idea of the definition being an evolving modern best practices in the Jamstack. And yeah, I think and I think the influence at the the core what we thought of Jamstack for the span of two years has drastically influenced how we do web development going forward for yep. years to come. Well, and, and you think about the ecosystem around it, and a lot of the tools were already in existence before we had this idea of the Jamstack. We had AWS, right? Mm -hmm. We had S3 buckets, we had Lambda, we had all this stuff already around. And not to like throw shade, but they were all incredibly hard to use. Like yeah. you really had to know what you were doing to use them. All the tooling that has come up because the Jamstack kind of went mainstream and like companies like Netlify, like Vercel raised what we would consider the table stakes of what a, stat a static site host or a Jamstack host should do was beneficial to everybody and created like this, this dichotomy, right? This, this issue of what the heck even is the Jamstack if it's really just the way we make websites nowadays? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's a, a rising tide lifts all boats or whatever they say, right? Like that's that's what that's where <laughs> we're at now. What's that's that phrase, a, James? <laughs> a rising boat sinks the ship. I don't. We oh try. We try. We try to use. <laughs> no, you this said on rising multiple. boats rise the tide. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Well, the, the more boats you put in the water, I suppose, like Does with water see? displacement, it raises it, it raises the ocean time. this much, this tiny little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried to use that phrase many times. And I think like Amy and I both have, and we always like stumble on it and never quite get it right. Um so let's say why don't we leave like definition of Jamstack aside? I think I think we probably agree, like we have our own thoughts. It doesn't really matter technically like what we call it to individual people, as long as we understand what we're talking about in conversations about how we build stuff and what our approach is, et cetera. Um, but the title of this was turbocharging the power of the Jamstack, <laughs> which gets into like all these other things probably that like sit complimentary or on top of the Jamstack or however you want to look at it. So what are, what are some of the things that come to mind for you when you think about turbocharging the power of the Jamstack? Well, and we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about them in general, right? Like serverless functions, super important edge functions nowadays um, are, are 
maybe not equally as important, but super, super helpful in a lot of ways. And then the, kind of the entire ecosystem around it, serverless databases, headless CMSs, um, all the different APIs around the space, the, the contentfuls of the world or the, um, uh, like, I don't know, Airtable even, like anything that has an API then becoming a tool in the arsenal of a web developer uh, is absolutely amazing. Uh, although like thinking, thinking this through, right? And like we had the conversation earlier around, um, which I suppose may or may not be on the episode, but around how, uh, how the uh, meta frameworks have evolved in ways to solve previous issues of meta frameworks. And we kind of see that same thing happening in the tooling space around the Jamstack where maybe not frameworks or companies, but the tools that are needed to do the more complex things that we want to do keep evolving and they keep growing and you keep having to know more and more uh, and so there's there's kind of movements happening to kind of bring that back kind of full circle around to making more simplified versions of the things that we need. So you've got 8,000 APIs you could use to do the various things that you need to do. You've got like six different headless CMSs that are, you know, at the top of the market. You've got like serverless data is a huge thing now. Like we had Fauna back in the day and that was great. But now we've got like Zata and like there are other ones coming out and kind of having all these these same kind of things. But like bringing all that back together is super important too and making kind of powerful uh, APIs around whatever it is that you need for the the use cases that you've got uh, is is kind of incredibly powerful. And we've seen that in a few different ways kind of coming into the industry uh, in, in the past like two or three years. It feels like you can plug in anything, anything that you want or need to do from an API perspective or a logic perspective. Like think about how many e-commerce plugins and packages we have. We've got authentication with all zero and other solutions. We've got serverless databases that also take HTTP endpoints, which now work in serverless functions. And again, it's to me, it's like, I think what I consider kind of the core of the Jamstack two years ago or whatever, I think that was the thing that started to make significant changes in how we build sites because we just hit limitations and then we started evolving around that to get to the point where we're doing a lot of the things that we used to do in Ruby on Rails and server-generated pages, et cetera. And so we've almost come full circle, but in a way that now someone phrased this the other day that was like really meaningful to me. Uh, we've, we've not gone full circle, but we spiraled either up or down to where we're spiraling more and more. The spirals are getting smaller, meaning mm -hmm. we're, we're like experimenting, experimenting, and we're narrowing down on the things that we think are the best practices and the tools and getting a better evolution of that. Because now it's much easier to do server rendered whatever because of the tools and frameworks that we have in place around them. So we realize that like there's benefits to it. Not only do we circle back, but we also do it in a way that's much easier, more productive than how we did it in the past. And that, that kind of goes in also with the, with the idea we kind of talked about before where like we had, we had all these serverless things. We had the ability to do everything that we, that we kind of do nowadays without thinking about like it's 2023, right? So like, little Something. like a decade ago like maybe a little under a decade ago like we had a lot of stuff in in like the the aws ecosystem and it wasn't great and then there were more more and more needs that got built tools upon and it's the same thing with the frameworks it's the same thing with all the tooling it's like oh we need uh, a serverless database. We need our database. Oh, the database also needs to be able to do the same thing our HTML does, right? It needs to be served from a CDN as close to the user as possible, because as it turns out, we can't break the speed of light. Uh, so we need acid compliant, <laughs> blah, 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 I'm not a database person, uh, data. And so the tooling came up around that. Like Fauna was built from the the old like database team at Twitter, and like they they knew how to scale this sort of thing, and they built a, a scalable, acid compliant database for the Jamstack for serverless. Uh, and it's the same thing that we're kind of seeing nowadays as well with you know all the headless CMSs out there. They're each kind of solving their own niche, but they're also building on the ideas from the past and figuring out how to how to move us forward in a meaningful way, both from a developer experience perspective, but also from, from an end user experience perspective as well. Amy has a hard stop at the hour. Oh. Um, I'm thinking if we want to just do picks and plugs now, and then we can edit oh, sure. in like some yeah. of the previous conversation. It's going to be a great, a great editing job <laughs> on this one. <laughs> I know. Um, actually here, I'll just kind of queue it up. 
So we actually had uh, some really good conversation before we started recording about um, hot takes and web development. <laughs> yeah, basically everything that you can think of. That's a ton of fun. So we're going to edit in that here so you can all listen to that conversation. We think it makes perfect sense for this episode. So here is the fun conversation that we had earlier. <laughs> And by perfect Actually. sense, it's the three of us. <laughs> That's the only yeah. thing that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> and then, uh, Amy, do you want to move us into the picks and plugs? Yeah. So for the next section of the episode, we will do our picks and plugs. So this is something generally that we pick something that we like or that we've worked on. No, we pick something that we like, and then we plug something generally that we've worked on or that we want to promote. So I can kick us off for my pick. And I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I just got a new toothbrush that I'm super excited about. Actually, our whole family got these new toothbrushes. So I've heard ads for them. I bet you could get it at Costco, but I did not get mine. Uh, it is the Quip toothbrush, Q-U-I-P. Um, very popular. I've heard ads for them, but the kids dentist recommended them because they will vibrate. And every time you're supposed to change where you're brushing, it will do give you a little buzz buzz. So, um, I, my mouth has felt the cleanest since I went to the dentist. So it's fantastic. Definitely, uh, have enjoyed my new toothbrush. And the cool part is the stand for it also works as a ni nice little travel case. So the packaging on it is beautifully designed for my plug. I saw somebody mention this in the chat, but I'm going to plug monthly CSS and monthly JavaScripts. I was creating some new content for that this weekend that hopefully be able to drop soon, but you can sign up for free and get monthly challenges and the solutions all for free. So check that out at monthlycss.com and monthlyjs.com. Okay. I'm going to, Brian, are you... Brian, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Amy. To... Good, to see you, Amy. <laughs> Good chatting. Brian, are you ready to share picks and plugs? Sure. Uh, so I don't have anything as cool as Amy on, in terms of picks, although I will say a toothbrush that vibrates when you need to change the spot that it's that you're brushing is a game changer. Like <laughs> I, I don't even know what brand I have, but mine does that and it's it's nice to have. Um, that being said, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go techie and say uh, Astro just put out their 2.0 uh, last week or the week before. I haven't dug into the 2.0, but uh, it's a good opportunity just to plug them. I think that they're doing amazing things uh, with kind of the evolution, speaking of the evolution of the Jamstack, right? Like in, in keeping things static, but layering on a ton of additional things on top of it. So I, I appreciate all they're doing and I'll give them uh, my pick this week. Um, and then uh, for plugs, I'll, I'll give two plugs. One's a super professional plug and say that um, the high graph community is, is around and we have a Slack community. And I'll say that if you're looking for content, uh, I just released a pretty good YouTube video, I think, uh, last week around my pick. Uh, and it was doing a lazy loading uh, content uh, timeline in Astro.js. And I enjoyed it a lot. So the, the high graph uh, YouTube channel, it should be the latest uh, there because it's going to be another week or two before I've got another video, but uh, I'd say that's a good one. And then uh, personally, I am finishing up my very first book to be published uh, on 11D. It'll be called 11D by example. I don't have the Amazon link yet, although I'm supposed to get it very soon. Uh, and it's it's basically five projects in 11D uh, spanning about 10 chapters. And it should take you from zero to fully up and running in my personal favorite static site generator. Um, in, I don't know, 150, 200 pages, something like that. So um, just finished the last chapter this past weekend and going through the edits. Sweet. I'm excited for that. We You had mentioned it earlier and I had blanked on that, but I knew I know we had talked about that before. Uh, whenever it's ready, let me know. I'll make sure to share. Will do. I'm also a huge fan of Astro. Um, Astro 2.0, doing a stream on migrating 2.0 is on my backlog. So maybe next week, next week after I uh, finish some other stuff, but I'm excited about that too. Uh, for my pick, I'm going to do a lens adapter for uh, the Canon M50. So the Canon M50 is a mirrorless camera. It doesn't let you, by default, use a lot of the standard lenses that people are used to with other Canon cameras. I don't even know a great way to, to articulate this other than like the actual way it connects is a different mount than a lot of the other cameras. So anyway, you can buy an adapter that you can attach to the Canon M50. And then that um, has a, basically a converter adapter thing to the kind of more standard, I guess it's for ES or EF lenses. So a converter from 
EF EOS M, which I think is what the Canon M50 takes, to an EF. No, I said that wrong. I don't know. It converts <laughs> the mount for the lenses and allows me to use lenses that are um, used in other popular <laughs> Canon cameras. Sorry, I butchered that. Uh, but I actually have a lens coming in the, the mail tomorrow that I'll be able to use with this, which is the Nifty 50. People Pancake lens. People talk about that one a lot. I don't know much more than that other than it should be fun. I will say like I, I know very little about cameras, but like the the idea of the adapters that allow you to use basically any brand's lenses mm -hmm. means you can also get cheaper lenses that are just as yep. good for whatever kind of camera you've got, which is awesome. Yep. And I have I have a few Sigma lenses for I have a the same Sigma lens for my Canon M50 and for my Sony A6400, which is a different brand that's cheaper, but also like one of the best for what it is. And it works um, on both without an adapter, which is cool. Anyway, so there's this adapter that I have to be able to use more lenses. And then I will plug the Learn, Build, Teach community, Discord community. I've uh, been doing more like internal live streams there and then uh, working to add more functionality to the bot and automations and all sorts of fun stuff. So if you're interested in joining uh, that, you can find it at learnbuildteach.com. All right, Brian, thank you for joining us. This has been a ton of fun. Yep. Uh, if you are all listening on Podcatcher, uh, please make sure to leave a rating and review to help other people find the podcast. We can continue to have amazing guests like Brian coming on. Once again, Ryan, thank you. Appreciate it. It's been In real. the meantime, that's we got. That's all we got. That's we got. All right, and we're still live on the stream. Let me see if there's anybody on Twitch. To, um, I'm going to send everybody on Twitch over to Jen. Hmm. Jen. I've never heard her last name pronounced. Jen Junod? Jinod? Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't actually know how to pronounce her name, but. Is that she has what like learn learn with Jen or uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah yep cool all right I'm gonna send everybody over there thanks everybody for watching and commenting this is a fun conversation yeah and uh, we'll catch you later.